Black History Month is here, and while it is vital that we celebrate Black poets, authors, leaders, playwrights, and activists all year long, this is a great time to put a special focus on spotlighting all the wonderful Black voices in the ELA world. There are so many to choose from. So today, I want to share some easy ways to do that. Today, tomorrow, all through February, and all year long. Hey there, I'm your host, Betsy Potash, and One Pager's project-based learning and choice reading are my jam. I believe in you, and my goal is to help you explore all the creative possibilities you dream of for your classroom. I'm an educator, a chocolate cake aficionado, a traveler who can't wait to get back to Barcelona, and the kind of mom who brings her own mini maker space to her kid's classroom when she comes to volunteer. I know this for sure, creativity isn't always easy. As a creative teacher, you get parent calls you treasure and plenty of sidelong comments you'd rather forget. But here's the bottom line. Creative education can ignite a spark in your students and change their lives forever. You and I know this. You're an innovator. And while it's sometimes hard, it's so worth it. So let's explore the world of creative education together. Welcome to the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast. Okay, so the very first thing I want to suggest is to showcase black authors that you love with a QR code display on your wall or in your hallway. And this is something you can build out yourself, but I have actually already made one for you, a free display that you can grab from the show notes today at nowsparkcreativity.com. And it features um, historical authors like Langston Hughes and Ralph Ellison alongside contemporary figures like Jason Reynolds, Trevor Noah, and Michelle Obama. And there are basically little kind of mini posters that feature um, an author and then a little bit about them, a little bit of a biography, and then a QR code that goes to somewhere online where a student could explore more, maybe read some poems or see a short video or explore an interactive website to get to know that author a little bit more. And once you have this up on your wall, there are 12 different authors featured along with kind of like a header and some visuals to go around the little mini posters. You can use this throughout the month. You can let early finishers go up and explore. You can do a bell ringer where you invite students to come over, choose an author, explore the website. You can do that multiple times. You can make it part of a station. Um, it just kind of provides a context and, and by doing some activities that relate to the display, you bring all of your students notice to the fact that it's Black History Month, to the fact that there are all these fantastic authors that they could be exploring both at your display, but also at the library or at the bookstore. It just sort of puts these wonderful authors front of mind for your students. All right, I'm going to talk about one more visual thing. I know this is a podcast, so it's not ideal. But I also want to mention that there are just the most wonderful posters over at Education Amplifier. So if you go to amplifier.org or search Amplifier Art in your toolbar or link up from the show notes today, um, you will find this beautiful organization, Amplifier, that works with amazing artists around the world to create Um, these different campaigns. And the campaigns basically have uh, free art downloads for everyone, for anyone, for educators, community members, parents, anybody who wants to print out these beautiful positive representations. And there are so many that feature Black artists and activists and leaders. And you can print those up and have them on your classroom wall. Um, You will also find posters representing all different groups of people, um, and certainly as you're exploring looking for black leaders and activists, you'll find you'll find ones from other groups too, which is wonderful. So I really, really, really recommend the site Amplifier, and I hope you'll check it out. All right, next up, I want to talk about a couple of authors. Now, there are so many authors that I could spotlight in this show, but I'm just going to talk about two contemporary authors that I just see students loving. And I see... You know, you can never say 
that every student is going to love an author because <laughs> it's impossible to please everyone. But these are two authors that I just, I just don't hear stories from teachers about flops. I only hear stories about how great it's going, how shocked they are about how much students are loving these authors. <laughs> and these authors are Jason Reynolds and Trevor Noah. So let's start with Jason Reynolds. There, there are a lot of ways to bring Jason Reynolds into your classroom. He has been if you don't know, the National Library of Congress's ambassador for youth literature. And he's been so active in this role. Not only has he been writing books, but he's been doing all these sort of multimedia collaborations and interviews and just really being out there as an ambassador to help kids like reading more. And I couldn't love that more, as you can imagine. So let's talk about some ways to bring Jason Reynolds into your classroom. Number one, you could advocate to use one of his books in class, either as a whole class text or as a book club. You could advocate for it across your grade level or just in your own room. I think Ghost, in my opinion, is a really good choice for middle school. And then there's a whole series that follows it that you could feature on your toys reading shelves. Um, I love all the books in that series. It's a four book series. Ghost could easily stand alone, the first book in the series, but really so could any of them. And they're just lovely books. Um, for ninth or 10th grade, I think Long Way Down is the way to go. This is a novel in verse, and it's extremely powerful and extremely easy to read. There's also a graphic novel version of it, which makes it all the more accessible to students across levels. And then if you're looking for a really advanced book, like a 12th grade or an AP lit or lang, um, I would consider All American Boys, which is co-written um, with, with another wonderful author and, and just such a powerful book. I really encourage you to look into it if you've never heard of it and you're looking for a text for older kids. Then another option with Jason Reynolds, did you know he has 30 video writing prompts? And these, these maybe angle a little bit toward the younger, so like 7th, 8th, ninth. He has this series called Write, 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 and they're spelled all the three different ways that write can be spelled. Um, and they're just these like fun little video prompts. And each one he introduces, he sort of gets kids warmed up to the idea and then gives them something to write about. Okay, then there's his kind of amazing four-line poem that has been expanded into this long, beautiful book um, with his artist friend whose name is suddenly escaping me. Oh, I can't remember. So he and his friend, who is an incredible artist, created this together. It's not like his friend was illustrating his poem. It's like they were... They were both sharing experiences around the same thing. The, the protagonist of Ain't Burned All the Bright is a, is a young man experiencing the pandemic, experiencing the George Floyd protests and all that came with that period in American history. And it is such a beautiful book. It's it's you know, it really grapples with some difficult things. And in the end, it's really ultimately hopeful. Um but it's so unique in the fact that there's just a few words on each page alongside a really um, powerful, interesting illustration. And, you know, a student can read it in probably half an hour, 45 minutes. <laughs> so I think this would be a great mentor text for some kind of a multimodal project, a project where you want students telling a story through multiple forms. It would also be a great text in a poetry unit or a graphic novel book club or as a feature in your independent reading program. Okay, another great option for Jason Reynolds would be to use his work for First Chapter Friday. He has a ton of books. I really liked his book, um, As Brave As You, for middle school. I don't hear about that one as much, but I read it to my son, who's 11, and we loved it together. So that would be a good one you could consider for First Chapter Friday with your younger kids. With older kids, you could do um, the track series or Long Way Down or All American Boys if you're not doing them in another way. Jason Reynolds actually reads the first chapter of Ghost Out Loud on YouTube so you can have him be your guest reader for First Chapter Friday. All right, next you could use his book Stamped um, that he did with Ibram X. Kendi um, as a 
as a part of your unit around issues of social justice or um, identity, you could have him have him read aloud. The, I listened to the audiobook a few summers ago, and it's it's read so beautifully by him. Um, to give you a little bit more background, Stamped is like the story of black racial history. And um, Ibram X. Kendi wrote it first, and Jason Reynolds adopted, adapted it for young readers. And then he's the narrator for the audiobook. And um, it really just, it tells a lot of history quickly and clearly. And um, the way he uses his voice to read it, you know, just really, I think, makes it all the more accessible for kids. Um, so you could use it also as a nonfiction book club study or a nonfiction study in class, or you could use sections of it to complement a unit, um, that relates to race and identity. Okay. Was that five? I think that was five. I could go on you guys. I could go on. <laughs> Jason Reynolds is just amazing. What I have to tell you about Trevor Noah is a bit quicker. He has written this memoir. If you haven't seen it, it's called Born a Crime and his stories from his life growing up in South Africa when he was born during apartheid and then as apartheid ended and his life after that. And it is um, a wonderful, funny, powerful memoir that talks about a lot of really serious issues in the world, but also with kind of Trevor Noah's hilarious frank style um and and i again just repeatedly hear from teachers oh my students loved it oh my students loved it <laughs> that's what i hear i'm still waiting to hear from somebody who says like oh i tried it and it didn't really work so i would really consider this for a whole class novel or a book club's choice um maybe in like an identity theme or a memoir theme there is a young adult version, which is nice. There's not like a lot of language or really rough situations that you wouldn't let, um, you know, ninth or 10th graders read, but there are, there are some slightly more mature things. Yeah. And the young adult version cuts out anything that you might have to worry about. So if you have younger readers or you're, you're dealing with a conservative community or your students are not quite as mature, um, you could look at the young readers version. And if you feel like your students could probably handle it, um, you could preview the, the full version and just check and make sure that it's right for your students. But this is a great book. I loved it. I think you will. I think your students will. Okay, up next... Now, you may have heard me talk before, back in episode 163, I spoke with veteran teacher Jane Wisdom about using a research project I call a carousel project. So if you are on Instagram at all, you might have seen the type of post where you just kind of swipe along a series of six or seven or eight slides, and the first one introduces a topic, and then the next ones carry it through. They tell more statistics, they share more images, they get you more and more interested and kind of suck you in until you've swiped all the way to the end. And it's a really neat way to share information. And I like this product for students with research. Instead of a traditional research paper, they take what they learn from their research and they create a swipeable image-based carousel that has both text and imagery. Now, I think this applies really well to focusing on leaders and activists. So you could invite students to focus on a black leader, activist, artist, or author that they're really interested in and do a research project where they dig deeper, find out more about this person, and then translate what they find into a research carousel. Okay, next up, I'm really excited about this one. I shared about this a little bit on Instagram last week and other people seemed really interested too. There is a performance by Whitney Houston at the Super Bowl in 1991. Now this is going to seem <laughs> a bit random, but stay with me. This performance is a perfect opportunity to share about rhetorical situation. So if you teach rhetorical analysis, I'm really going to encourage you to integrate Whitney Houston's Super Bowl performance in 1991 into your unit. Okay, so maybe you're teaching about ethos, pathos, and logos. You're teaching about rhetorical techniques, but you're probably also teaching about rhetorical situation because that's like the heart of it, right? The, the kind of central star of any rhetorical... Um, 
situation, any, any speech or song or advertisement or whatever, you have to kind of get your grip on the purpose and the audience and, and the motivating factors for the performer. And this Super Bowl has so much context and the experience of watching Whitney Houston sing the Star Spangled Banner in 1991 at the Super Bowl before you understand the context and after you understand the context are just completely different. I mean, I, 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 had tears in my eyes watching this performance once I understood the context. Whereas before, and I was just like, yep, whatever. It's the Star Spangled Banner, you know, she's a great singer. But but here's the deal. She um, sang this song 10 days after the U.S. entered the Gulf War. And so America was just kind of freaked out. Um, it was a, it was a time when people were looking for comfort. It was a time when people were really focused on patriotism. It was a time when for the first time the Super Bowl was surrounded by kind of barricades so that no terrorists would be able to get in, which was kind of a new idea for American citizens and suddenly a very scary idea. So Whitney Houston was there to kind of comfort a nation that was very frightened. And at the same time, she was, she was, engaged in her own meteoric rise to fame, but at a time when black musical artists were not being recognized by the kind of music industry machine in the way that they should have been. MTV was refusing to feature Michael Jackson's videos, um, and Whitney Houston was having to kind of battle her way through an industry that should have just kind of been revering her, right? She had had all these number one hits. She was this incredible musician, but her, her path was far from smooth. And so here she is at the Super Bowl kind of... At, at this jagged intersection where these painful things are happening in the country, these painful things are happening in the music industry, and she has to decide how she's going to step up to the microphone and how she's going to do this performance. What is she going to wear? What? How much is she going to add of her own style to the music? Um, what is the feeling going to be? And it's really... When you understand that, it is so powerful. And so what I have for you in the show notes today is a is a little project that you can do with this performance. It's a Super Bowl rhetoric one-pager, and it invites students to think about what are the ethos, pathos, and logos of this performance? What is the situation? Um what is happening around the performance and what is happening in the performance. And it's really like when I was creating my model, I was just like, man, this is so interesting. This is so, this is so fascinating. And so, you know, obviously I'm a geek like that, but I hope that it will feel the same for you and your students and you will just really um, see the power of that rhetorical situation. Okay. Up next Explore picture books by black authors. Now, we have talked before on this podcast with Pernille Rip last year about the power of illustrated books in the secondary classroom, in the middle school classroom. It does not just have to be for second and third graders. There are so many outstanding illustrated books out in the world for for people of all ages. And I'm just going to suggest a couple. You could find so many. I love Kwame Alexander's book, How to Read a Book. And he's soon going to be coming out with an extension called How to Write a Poem, which I bet is going to be amazing. (laughs) So I really recommend those two for your classroom. And then a favorite in my own home is the book Hair Love. And it's a little girl. She's trying to do her hair. And we don't know why her mother isn't there. Her father is like really tired. He's asleep on the couch. She's worried about him. She's trying to figure out how to do her hair and she's she's really struggling. And she and her dad end up watching a movie of her mom teaching them how to do her hair. Her mom, it looks like, is a is a hair influencer and has created all these tutorial videos to help kids and their parents do their hair. And her dad helps her to do these beautiful um, kind of like, I'm trying to remember what it's called, if they're kind of like Supergirl puffs or something like that. My daughter asked for them for months after watching or not watching, reading the book. Um, and I was always trying to get her hair into this lovely little style from the book. But anyway, it's a lovely book. And then 
um, at the end of it, the, the mom comes home and the mom has her, has her head wrapped in a scarf and it seems like she's coming home from the hospital. It's not 100% clear, but it seems like the family is being reunited after the mother has been away and been ill. Um, and the neat thing about this book is that it's been adapted into a short film, which won an Oscar. And so you can, you can do something with adaptation around how do you take a story and turn it into a visual um, in a, in a different genre. And so that can be a, a mentor text, or it can be, you can talk about what are the differences, what are, what's pulling across that's exactly the same. How did the director highlight different themes or bits of meaning through the video? Okay. Last but not least, I want to talk about performance poetry and contemporary poets. They're, this is such a a rich place um, to search for wonderful black authors, black writers. And I, I immediately think of Amanda Gorman, of course, because I think at the moment she's a youth icon. Not only is she this poetry superstar, but she's super fashionable. She's doing tons of work on social media. She's, she's taking part in all these different sorts of international campaigns around different issues that are meaningful. And so, I mean, why wouldn't we be using her in class whenever we can, right? Like Jason Reynolds, I feel like she's just sort of like a, a superhero on our team. Um, and so I would... Definitely, if you're not already, I would teach A New Day's Lyric or The Hill We Climb at some point this year and every year. Um, but I also really like her poem called Earth Rise. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's it's like a video poem. It's four minutes long, and it's a really lovely exploration of kind of um, what each person can do about climate change and global warming but kind of like it sets this historical context. Earthrise is the name of kind of the first time these astronauts who went to the moon saw Earth rising in the sky instead of seeing the sun rise or the moon rise. They saw Earth rise. And so it's, it starts in this historical moment and then it moves out um, and talks about sort of how the world is changing and what we can do about it. And it's very hopeful. And I think that sometimes um, when we talk about global warming with kids, it can it can feel, you know, just devastating. It can feel very dark and dystopian. And the way she frames it in Earthrise doesn't feel like that. It feels empowering. Like, look, this is this is sort of recent history and this is what we can do and and let's do it um so i think it's a great text you could talk about so many different things with it but maybe one thing you could talk about is how how poetry can relate to activism and how a creative form can have a message you know it can have an argument and i think that's a really f fascinating and empowering thing to talk about with kids. Okay, there are also so many other choices. <laughs> if you want to do some great performance poetry with your students, I always find that performance poetry helps capture students' interest in poetry in general. So I always like to start any poetry unit with contemporary poetry, performance poetry, just to kind of to hook them. So some of my um, recommended titles would be I really like Smokey Robinson's poem Black American that he did on Deaf Poetry Jam. It's like a fascinating look at the different names throughout history in America for being black and he 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 gives his poem so beautifully. It's an 11 minute performance which kind of boggles the mind. It's a long um interesting poem. Anyway, I'll just say that. You can you can watch it. I've got all these poems linked on the podcast show notes today. So there's Smokey Robinson, Black American. I would really recommend Rudy Francisco's My Honest Poem. A lot of people use that as the base of having students write a poem called My Honest Poem. You could check out Joe Davis and his poem Show Up, Marshall Jones and her his poem Touchscreen. And then I found a video of Maya Angelou's poem still I rise of her reading it and it's just stunning <laughs> so I've linked up those five poems along with some work by Amanda Gorman in the show notes today to give you some options for contemporary poets but of course there are so many 
Okay, so let's do a quick review, my friend, of all these ideas. These are for Black History Month, but they're really for all the time. You can grab that free hallway or classroom display from the show notes that showcases 12 black authors. I really hope you'll come and grab it and print it and put it up. Maybe snap a photo, maybe tag me on Instagram at now spark creativity. I'd love to see how it looks in your classroom. You can go to Amplifier and get a whole bunch more amazing posters to use all year long. You can feature Jason Reynolds and Trevor Noah. Of course, you could also feature other contemporary awesome authors like Angie Thomas, Nick Stone, Nicola Yoon. There's many wonderful contemporary um, authors in the YA space and, of course, out out beyond so many (laughs) Um, You could do a Black Leaders and Activists Carousel Project. You could let students find the artists, the activists, the leaders, the poets that they are really interested in and and research them and create um, a visual product, that swipeable carousel. You could dig into rhetorical situation with Whitney Houston's amazing Super Bowl performance from the 1991 Tampa Super Bowl and all the curriculum for that you can sign up for in the show notes. I can send it to you straight to your email. You could explore picture books by black authors like Kwame Alexander's books, How to Read a Book and How to Write a Poem and Hair Love and so many more. You could feature contemporary poets like Amanda Gorman, Smokey Robinson, Rudy Francisco, Joe Davis, and more. Okay, I'm sure you could add so many things to my list. This is just a starting point, but I wanted to share some ideas and celebrate Black History Month with you today on the podcast. All right, thanks so much for being here today to talk about Black History Month and how we can celebrate and lift up the voices of Black authors and poets and leaders all year long. Until next time, take care of yourself and stay creative.